Today is the first beach day of the Orange Coast College Surfing and Ocean Safety Class. I have to admit, it's pretty cool having the beach as your classroom. This is my second time taking the class. The last time I took the class was when the COVID-19 pandemic hit and then the class was moved onto Zoom, which was a unique experience. A lot has changed for me since the last time I took the class, like the fact that I now take ice baths. However, I gained surfing experience in spite of the pandemic thanks to a meetup group and also I went out on my own a few times. twice by our boats that they need to stay farther offshore. What we do is we tell people on boats, the end of the jetty to the Balboa up here, don't go inside of that because we get big waves that come and, well, they do this. Right about now, this guy's thinking to himself, well, this isn't the harbor entrance. Oh, I'm just gonna go to where the wave's bigger and I'm gonna aim at the rocks. That seems safe. Oh, glad I'm wearing a life jacket. Now, it's amazing how much power the ocean has. It can park your wave runner for you. <laughs> and later on, you'll see that it can unpark your wave runner for you. Now, I'll tell you right now, the only reason these two people are alive is because they're wearing life jackets. And during boating safety courses, we tell people this. Clearly an accident, right? But these people in the water right there, you'll see when we pull them out, we're literally carrying a woman the guy can barely walk to. They probably wouldn't have popped up after that first wave. And they'd be still boiling down there. The last time we lost a person, we had, well, Ed Wedge, we had a, one of our guards with them right there, grabbed him from underwater, got knocked by a wave just like that, lost him again. We found him a few waves later and they were gone. So these people are really, really lucky. You can see me back there, the calls come in. The call came over 5320, which is our supervisor. 5320, uh, we have a wave runner inside a wedge on the rocks. You hear that call, you just go, great, okay, who's dead? Because that's pretty much, I mean, you can, you can see the situation, it's pretty bad. This, these guys swimming over, the guy in the front is actually an off-duty lifeguard. Then we have a bunch of guys from the beach coming out. One of them happens to be Aaron Pearsall, who got to them first, who's a, if you don't know who he is, he has a lot of Olympic gold medals. Uh, one of the fastest swimmers in the world. We were lucky enough to have him as a lifeguard at the time. There's another off-duty lifeguard right there. Fast forward a little bit. This is where the ocean unparks your wave runner. <laughs> okay, we were doing okay. We had guards in the water. We have a guy on the, on the rocks watching everything in case somebody gets in trouble. Well, now there's another piece of shrapnel involved here, right? You've got the, it's clearly inside. It barely makes it over this way. What happens if that thing gets caught and runs right over all of our rescuers and our victims, right? Not a good program. You can see the wave that's uh, inside the inside the harbor entrance. It's illegal to surf there. Other side's illegal though. Who's I finally get there. Who's filming it? So if you ever go out a wedge on a big day, there's like 50 cameramen down there, and half of them are professional photographers. They don't do this for a living, but they do sports photography for a living. And this just happens to be one guy who got a really good angle, had his camera ready to go at the time. I'm not sure of the name of that. That's an off-duty lifeguard, Ethan. At this point, I don't know that that's Ethan. I just see a guy in the wave runner, and the call that we went for was wave runner on the rocks, people in the water. I thought it was a victim. So we throw him a line. Right about now, I realize that's Ethan, and I'm mad at myself because I wanted to get the line to him and wrap around the wave runner to save that, but what you gonna do, right? Okay, here I see there's a set coming. We start to idle out. 
<clears throat> we had about three waves to make this operation happen. And from here, we have about three more waves before the wave runner finally gets rolled in. You can see all of our rescuers down here. That lady's getting dragged out. She had a bad tender day. <laughs> and we barely made it over that wave as we're trying to pull this down on the boat. You can see the guy right there hobbling, collapses through his knees. And here goes the wave. At this point, I'm outside making a PA telling everybody to get away from the wave runner. I don't want it to kill you. Upside down. He's like, what just happened? <laughs> it's one of our guards going, you gotta be kidding me. So anyways, I'm gonna stop this before we get too much of this going on. You guys billing for that? <laughs> Believe it or not, we don't bill for any lifeguard services. Other agencies do. If that had happened in Long Beach, they would have been billed for it because they actually have a tow boat right. service that they provide. Um, we don't do that. We let vessel assist do all that stuff, frankly, because we don't have enough boats on a daily day to be doing a tow service and to be doing a rescue service. We would need another boat. We are kind of your guts with both of us, but my name is Clay Reaper. I'm one of the lifeguard captains here. I can take this off while I talk, but. Uh, Brandon is a lifeguard officer here. Uh, I supervise Division One from Newport Pier all the way to the River Jetties. Um, you guys know that side of the border of Huntington. Um, I've been here for 18 years. I was seasonal. I started when I was 16. Oh, wow. um, and then I left and became a police officer for a number of years and came back uh, back to the tune about a year and a half now. So I was able to test and got the position. Very thankful. She asked earlier what my favorite part of the job is. Just honestly, being here on the beach every day, it's a great job. So, um, Brandon, how many years of freedom did you say earlier? I started in 98, so this is my 23rd, I think. Yeah. Long time. Oh, I got it to work. Oh, yeah, it's pretty work cool. Hooray! The previous <laughs> five, you can uh, go back to the Poseidon one. Or, there we go. Yeah. So, who, who, who creates surf? Does, does he create the surf? Do you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what we do? Wind, swell, that's what our, our uh, whole presentation is going to be about. So, we'll go to the next slide. Like I said, not from King Neptune, Biden, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so, we're going to go over the wave anatomy, uh, how they affect our beaches. Um, was it three or four weeks ago? We had that pretty big south swell. Yeah. Um, that's the most amount of sand that I've ever seen you do. So that's a, that's a big part of our, our part of our job here. We see um, up in West Newport, a lot of our sand moved and uh, pushed up towards the river We have to do a lot of uh, sand movement that we do to keep kind of our peninsula safe. Um, we can do that in the fall. Um, that's one way that it affects our beaches. Obviously, it affects our rocks and all that. So um, Newport Canyon, we'll go into that. Um, we'll see the pictures and slides. Um, that's off the pier here at the airport here, and then island blockage of Catalina that we have to deal with, and shoaling and fracking. So, the Life Magazine, do they even have that anymore? I don't think so. I wish. I think, I think it's on Insta now. Yeah. <laughs> so it starts with the storm. You have to fetch the distance the wind blows over the water. Um, the greater the distance it blows over, the bigger the swell. Uh, wind speed, that's the same thing. More wind speed, a bit more swell. And then time, how long does the uh, wind blow? That's a big one as well. Um, that's kind of a factor as well as hurricane swell. We'll talk about later. Uh, so if you guys know your global geography, uh, this is New Zealand down here. You got Australia. Usually it generates from back here in the winter time to the southern hemisphere. And that's when we get most of our south swells. Um, when you see like these purple blobs, sometimes we have them here. This is a pretty good size swell here with the red. Um, that's the fetch. We talked about the last slide, and it'll just start pushing up, and that's how we get our swells in the summertime. When you when you have been surfing for a little while and you want to start working out on swell prediction, if you're working for Surfline or something, they're going to measure the fetch from right where the wind starts to turn right where it starts to die and that's that's the fetch for that particular swell and it's kind of measured like that i would probably give it a, i would probably push it up a little bit but with refraction 
you'll you'll see later on that they're probably more accurate than I am. I've just done the old school way over the room for a long time because they don't have the stuff I learned how to do. Wind speed, uh, you'll notice that kind of like in the other slide, you had fairly fairly what well, looks like fairly strong winds because they're red. But if you look at this, that says 15. That's only 15 miles an hour. 15 knots, maybe, however they're going to do it, but 15 knots is 16 miles an hour. Same thing. But since that fetch is super long, we're going to get head high plus surf. As far as wind speed, this is just a diagram of, you'll notice over here there's a storm that's hitting uh, South America. This, this one uses a different diagram showing the wind speed up to 28 miles an hour. Some of the different colors we'll see. So from those swells, you can see it's uh, March 29th is this uh, particular uh, chart. And we got it on May 2nd. So it took, what, four days for us to get that swell? You were out for this, right? I was. This is the year, I before, around. This is the year before I started lifeguarding. <laughs> this whole presentation is during the winter time, we're gonna get the west swells, northwest swell, uh, and that is primarily gonna be focused on that area between you know, say 32nd Street and Blackies, um, and then during the summer we're looking at south swells. Um, so primarily out here at Blackies, I think you're expecting to get a bunch of surf during the uh, summertime. You're likely not going to get very much of it. it. It does happen, but it's not it's not often as the winter time. Um, and then there is this your spot you call it secret spot, right? <laughs> so secret spot is a great place to go surf. Uh, today we find. Um, winter time is great, um, but during the summertime we do get south swells there and you get a lot of uh, current pushing through there and you have a pretty dominant swell, it's not the greatest place to go surf. So um, kind of just keep that in mind, if you have a big south swell, go on the other side of the pier and you have much, luck, much more luck. Um, in the winter time, welcome to go surf out in front of the secret spot or here at Black East. Um, and then just like this photo shows, um, it's refracting, so we have the Newport Summary candy, candy um, right up here. It'll bounce or hit that and then refract off and kind of focus its energy towards 28th Street. Um, those are those larger west wells that we get during the winter time. And uh, it creates a pretty good peak right here. Um, we'll get the peak over here, the next to the pier, but uh, definitely bigger waves towards that. Uh, South Swell, 56th Street. I think this was uh, 2009. Um, that was a pretty large swell. On, um, I don't know if that photo is. is that photo that we have in the hallway from that or that from right? The big white one? Yeah. There's a photo somewhere around from, from 2009. Um, but that, that was a large swell that we did have um, in the July. Did we have that one? Yeah, it was, uh, I think it was, uh, it was like July 14th or something like that. But yeah, it was it was one of the biggest swells I've ever seen. It was pretty bad. Yeah, that was the year that gentleman passed away at, at that ledge. That's what we were talking about earlier. Where that area right next to the rocks is very crucial. So I got to work there that day. After that guy died, we pulled the guard that was working there because it's kind of a trauma, you know. And I ended up being the guy down there. It was freaking awesome. They pulled a couple guys down there. It was so much fun. Tragedy what happened, but it was a great day. Down there. Uh, so this is 56th Street, like we talked about before. Um, a lot of the energy is directed at 56th Street, 56th Street, but um, you see all the current we talked about, and later you talked about earlier, rip tides, rip currents. These are rip, this is a rip current, and that's what we call them. As all the current goes and hits the rocks and pushes out, um, this is a very large rip current, um, but this will happen frequently during south swells. Um, it, everyone's trying to sit for position here off the rock, um, and as you can see, there's no one there because of the river current. <laughs> uh, so yeah, everyone will get pushed out and they'll flush back around and then cycle around. Everyone kind of knows how to get out of the river current, right? So parallel up short. Uh, river currents can be anywhere. Uh, they just pick, pick a weak spot in the beach or they pick this certain spot that they like to come out of. Uh, there's, they're all over the place, so just be aware of that. And then another thing that you to know is um, during like west wind days, um, 
we kind of have to protect both sides of the rocks. We call this the, the danger triangle. But um, during the summer, we'll get some more west wind. And sometimes guys will surf out here. And it, it may be a smaller day, but we'll have a lot of people getting pushed into the rocks on this side because uh, that's the first groin up that way. And all that water is moving down and pushing up against these rocks. We have a slide of the danger triangle on the next slide. So we're going to go through real briefly. It's our our beach hazards rescue or our beach hazards lecture that we give our guards. We're just going to do a real quick run through. We're not going to do any of that stuff. This, this picture looks like one of those hurricane pictures, doesn't it? Totally, it really does. Um, you get a you get a big spiral up here in the head. It's pretty crazy. <clears throat> so if you're in that rip and you want to get out of it, where do you go? Anywhere. All pros are the ribs, huh? Okay, so you just battle this way or this particular one it dissipates we get a we'll get a uh, uh, set that'll come through let's just say it's an eight wave set once that eighth wave is over you'll, you've already got current going after the first one once that eighth wave is over you get about 30 seconds and then the whole thing starts to die which is great so if you just hang out on your board it'll dissipate and you can just keep surfing down the beach is that going to suck you underwater won't suck you under it'll just move you out you might end up in Catalina, but uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> and you, and they, they don't go out that far. Okay. They do, however, go out about a quarter of a mile, some of them, some of the bigger ones. And I'll show you one up in Huntington that does that later on. We'll, we'll go into the rift a little bit more. This is, but this is a great example of how it happens on the rocks. So we talked about uh, how we can be sheltered from where we can be shadowed by the island. This is a picture of it. If we have swell that comes from any of these areas, we don't get it. Believe it or not, there's some great surf spots on, on uh, San Clemente and Catalina that I've never been to, but I've seen pictures of. Chris Preston on boats. <laughs> and uh, there really is some good surf over there, out there on those islands. Also a lot of sharks. So, uh, again, I'm not going out there. But uh, in this whole area right here, it's Baja, they call it the Baja Shadow. That's totally true. The peninsula is kind of curved down a little bit, and if you're, if the storm that you're getting swell from, I wish we had a picture of it. There's a, um, at the name of there's an island down there, and as soon as the storm passes that island, that's when you know you're outside the swell window. It'll come. I don't believe our swells are swollen by Huntington, but Huntington does get bigger surf on less swell. The reason for that is, You've got this big plateau out here. Up until like this area, it's no deeper than 60 to 80 feet. Here, it's 3,000. So when you look at these oil platforms out there, not the ships, but just the platforms, the one on the far left is called Eureka. That one's in 600 feet of water. The one just to the right of it is in about 80 feet of water. That whole area is a big plateau. That's where all of our oil is. There and then up here too. Yeah, so what happens is like we talked about um, uh, refraction. The swell drags and it just gets channeled up towards Huntington. So, yeah, I mean, even if even if that area didn't exist, points still wouldn't break on it. Well, I'm not hard to so. That's primary with like the long, long period west swell. <coughs> if we have those short period west swells, those local uh, storms, we do get better waves up here at uh, Blackies. That's, that's what, what's yeah. Blackies gets real good on, on the west swell. Okay. Something out of uh, Alaska, kind of the left side of Alaska. Awesome. Okay, this is on to the next one. Yes. Where specifically is the Blackies? So Blackies is from the 28th Street groin right there to the uh, pier. Okay. Cool, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Why is it called Blackies? <laughs> The restaurant, yeah, or bar. <laughs> With like a piece. Mostly a bar. No, no, no. Mostly a bar. Mostly a bar. Anybody here colored one? I mean, um, black balls. Someone's got a oh, black ball. Okay, what color is this? Green. green. You see a green flag flying from our lifeguard tower, what's that mean? It's safe to swim. Right. It means it's safe, right? We only fly this flag when it's smaller. These flags are really meant for novice people, they're not meant for experts, so the better you get, the less these really apply to you, but the red applies to everybody. 
So, what color is this one? Yellow. Yeah. 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 Experienced surfers only. Right, it means experienced people only, but it also means if you are not on a surfboard, you have to have two fins or you're not getting any water. That's, that's the level that we put a yellow flag at, is you need equipment in order to keep yourself safe. Otherwise, we're just going to tell you not to go out past your knees. This one, red, right? I don't know why that means slap together. Red flag? What's the red flag? Mean? Dangerous so. surf professionals only. Right. That's a, that's a good way to put it. Dangerous surf professionals only. When we fly a red flag, we keep people out of the water. We ruin people's days. <laughs> Tell them they can't go in at all. Um, if you see a red flag, that means that it's one of the top 10% of the, of the biggest days that we're going to have that year. And lifeguards are going to be able to keep people out of the water. Yellow flag is going to be busy making rescues, which we love. Red flag means if we have to make a rescue, we screwed up, we should have been in the water. Now, how about this? This is everybody's favorite, right? No one can go in. Yeah, it means no one can have fun. Uh, so this is the black ball flag. It also, we also have a plaque that looks just like it that goes up on the towers. This is the no surfing plaque. No surfing is defined as standing up and riding a board. The board cannot have fins and it can't be over like 52 inches or something. So if you have... It's only standing up. If you stand up on the board, that's considered a sort of default zero. So if you're standing up, that's kind of an age of surfing. So, so uh, the black ball beaters, those things don't really work at all. Standing up, we're gonna ask you. But um, we've got the plaque, so we're gonna talk about that. So uh, at Big Corona, um, when you're surfing foamers, when it's okay to do it, what will happen is the plaque left from Tower Three, and then to the right area, that's where you can actually surf. Um, and then up at 44th to 40th Street, that's uh, called Boogie Land. So from May 1st, October 31st. Uh, no surfing, no hardboards. You can boogie board there. That's the top one. And then you got the wedge from May 1st to October 31st um, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. That's the only time you cannot uh, have any like flotation devices. That's the other cool thing. So no like uh, small boogie boards. Yeah, as experienced lifeguards, then like since you've been here, have you ever seen like a really big wedge swell that's like way out of season, like October, like when it's 21st? Yeah. 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 It's not common, but it happens every few years. What happens if you see those rocks and go, oh crap, I gotta go in because there's rocks there. You try and get in, you don't make it, you end up on the rocks. So a lot of times it's easier to go out and around than it is to come in. And that's a judgment call. You just have to sit there and go, oh crap, am I gonna make it in? This is our beautiful new pier. This was taken from the pier. Oh, wow. Big hurricane swell. Now these guys know what they're doing, right? They're paddling, they're fine, right? They're shooting right through the pier. <clears throat> that guy's in waist deep water. He can't even stand up. The current's going so fast. Um, you got another guy on the outside. Was there a flag up this day? A flag? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, okay. So you can see these guys got shot through the gear here. They're all okay. I mean, none of them are happy, <laughs> but they're all okay. And see, it's kind of, it's prob problematic for if you're gonna serve that black piece that day too, right? Oh, so if you're in this 22 area of the 24, uh, probably not the best place to serve that day. Uh, the current's gonna push you out and take you out the sea. Um, definitely you're asking about that. So, yeah. So if you are going through the pier, we, we always want you to keep your leash on, right? That just makes sense because now you're attached to your flotation device. What if you're going through the pier and your board's on one side of the piling and you're on the other side of the piling and you're just getting hung out to dry like this? What do you do that? Okay. Use your brain, take off your stinking leash. Okay. <laughs> if, if it's hurting you or making your situation worse, that's when you can take it off. If you're out in the middle of the ocean or whatever, don't take it off. We want you to be attached to it. Same thing if you're going around the rocks. If you're going around the rocks and your board gets stuck in the rocks, take off your leash. Right? <laughs> Makes sense. That almost never happens. But going through the pier, that does sometimes happen where you end up needing to take the leash off. 
Was that an all sudden happen? Were, were they out there and it was everything was normal and then all of a sudden it just came up? No, the current was pretty strong all day. And remember when I, uh, the picture at 56 where we had that big rip? Yeah. We had just had a big set come through. And so that first wave just kind of starts the river flowing. And by, the, by that last wave, that's how strong the current is. Yeah. The current gets that strong up by 56 too. That just happened to be a really good shot of it happening. Uh, those guys could have gotten in the water at 15th Street, never even made it outside and got shot from the pier for all I know. But yeah, that's, that's not really. It's cool. So this is Wedge. That's Tower Key. This is the crowd that we get. So when a lifeguard tells you, please don't stand where you're standing, the reason we're doing that is because this either just did or is probably about to happen to you. You can see that there's people in there. They're, yeah, they're wet now. Uh, so, which can get pretty big. We use this as a representation for our guards to just show them, sometimes you can't see when someone's in trouble. And this is really important for you to know. If you're right here, we can see you. If you're on the other side of this wave, we can't see you until the set's done. So if you put yourself in a situation like that, it's like, it's like driving behind a big truck, right? If you can't see their gears, they can't see you. It's the same thing. Someone could be right in the middle of those two waves dying right now, and the guy that took this picture, was, this is the tip of a flag that we fly during the 4th of July from our trucks. This guy was standing on the back of the truck taking a picture over the top of the truck to get the shot. He couldn't see anything that was going on. Um, so don't put yourself in that position. This is always fun. Scorpion, I think we're probably done with this. Oh yeah, that's just a cool shot. Bell's giving you a ticket. <clears throat> yeah, that's it. <clears throat> Alright. That's a good time. <laughs> so real quick, if you have any questions before we leave the classroom and go outside, we'll go out on the pier and take a look at uh, the way the beach curves and just kind of point out everything up and down the beach. Yes? Um, I seem to remember like he swam to Catalina. I wonder if he could tell that story again. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> sure. Uh, so in 2011, it's 10 years ago now, uh, I swam from Catalina to Palos Verdes. Uh, so it was just kind of a goal of mine. I sat on the beach there long enough, stared at it, and thought it was a good idea. And it was fun and I, I enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I went through a federation, uh, it's a Catalina Channel Swim Federation. Uh, started in, it's over at Doctor's Cove. It's up uh, by the Isthmus. You guys know kind of the geography of you know, Catalina. Um, started at 12.30 at night, and then I finished uh, 10 hours and 51 minutes later in that next morning. Um, you swim at night because you want it to be the smoothest amount of time. Um, again, primarily, like why we go surfing in the morning because there's less wind. Same thing at night, there's less, there's less uh, wind. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a good experience. I really enjoyed it. Uh, no wetsuits allowed, so you had to deal with the cold. And, um, hypothermia is a big problem in it, so you have to keep your core body up the entire time. Uh, part of that is learning how to like get the feed, you have to have your own carbs and all that stuff. So um, when you lay on your side, then you have basically time for 30 seconds. You drink whatever you're going to eat, what you need, and then keep going. If you drop your feet below you, your blood flows to your extremities and it cools you quicker, so your core body temperature will go down. So if you're ever caught in a situation where you're out in the middle of the ocean swimming around, uh, limit those times that you're stopping, and, and my suggestion is don't put your feet down or put your legs down, because gravity will push all that, that blood out. So, yeah, that, that's story. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So tomorrow's the uh, paddle from Newport, or from Catalina to Newport. Right. From Van Carlton. Yeah. What time do they usually end up riding? Around noon is the idea. Um, it's, it's always weather dependent though, and weather forecasts aren't great. They like to leave early in the morning, usually before the sun comes up. And yeah, so tomorrow, uh, there's gonna be an, in, an invitation only paddle. It's a fundraiser for the Ben Crossing Foundation. They paddle, do you know where they start? Where they start at? Yeah, I've never done it. Uh, why is your Avalon? I don't think they- I think it's Avalon. 
Okay. So you've got one. Just like they say it's like 30 miles. So when I did my the shortest point to point is from Doctors Cove to uh, Palos Verdes, and that's 20.14 miles. The currents and all that stuff, I ended up doing 22. The shortest, I it's 26 miles from here. Uh, so with the wind and the currents, they end up doing about I think like 30 days. So it's invite only. This year, I think there's around 65 people doing it. Normally, they try to limit it to 50, but this is just a big year. So, so yeah, that's that. Yeah, they, they arrived here in Newport here. Yeah. Yes. So when you're the one who did like that swimming, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, like how was it extremely hard? It was hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It took a lot of training, a lot of preparation, but I mean, for me, like I grew up swimming all my life, and uh, like for me, swimming is like walking. It's not super. It's not like, extremely hard. But if you do it for a long time, obviously it's going to yeah. be harder and you yeah. deal with it. I was, yeah, and I want to know what was going through your mind like when you're like when you're like in the middle. Uh, I got a playlist inside my head, and I just went through the playlist like time nice. after time. <laughs> so that's all I did, honestly. Nice. I wound up on a beach. I was like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. Good answer. Good answer. Yeah. How many people have done that now? No, so, uh, it's probably up in like when I did it, I was like 211 person that done it, oh, wow. um, but. There, I think it's up in the 400s now. Like, there's a couple of years where, like, I, I did it when it was the water was 65 and it ended at, I'm sorry, started at 67, and ended at 65. There's a number of years that we had these last couple of years where water temp ended up in the like, mid 70s, 80s, and people were taking advantage of that. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's a pretty special thing to be able to do that. Most of our guards could not do that, just to be clear. <laughs> but if you are interested in the guard, just High school swimmers that put in you know, multiple miles every day, sometimes almost twice a day. There's, Orange County has the best, fastest swimmers. Oh, yeah. We, I, and I'm not trying to say that everywhere else sucks, but we're, we're, the, we're the feeder program. If you end up being a great swimmer in Iowa, you come to Southern California to swim in college. And those are the, those are the level of people that you're up against. So, so yeah. Feel free to get the, join a swim team. Come on out. Uh, did that on this? Yes. Are you guys going to have an opportunity to talk about marine critters? Uh, are we going to come back here after the panel? Uh, we can, we can talk. Now a good time for that. Well, we already covered stingrays, but we can we can talk about uh, jellyfish real quick. We've actually had a few jellyfish lately. It's, we'll go years without having any jellyfish issues, and sometimes we do. You get hit by a jellyfish. Uh, you just put vinegar on, you can come up to us. We, a lot of times, will have vinegar. Um, we don't have the crazy man of war things that you get in tropical waters that'll kill you. We don't have any of that stuff. It hurts a lot, don't get me wrong. I've been, uh, I was stung years ago, and it went all over my face, all over my chest and my arm. And I ended up finishing out that day's worth of work, which sucked, but I, but I could do it. And we've had a lot of other people that that's happened to, too. Um, it hurts, but that's it. Now, as far as sharks, we can just address that problem directly. They're out here. Um, we haven't had a shark attack in the last four years, I think. 2015, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it might have been 2015, something like that. It was in Corona Del Mar. It was on a flat, calm day. It was somebody out swimming up the swim lines. Uh, it was a juvenile white shark, eight to nine feet long. It bit her three times. It Got her here, here, and here. It's called repurchasing. It's what the it's what the scientist guy told me. And uh, didn't kill her. She lived. She still swims out there now. And you know, but they're out there. Um, we don't have the same problem that you have in Northern California or Washington, where people get hit a few times a year. For us, we've had one attack in a hundred years, right? But they're out there. So nothing to be scared of. Just be careful. They exist, and when you see two sharks swimming next to each other, what are they? They're dolphins. They're not sharks. Sharks don't play with each other. True. They attack each other. True. So if you see two of them and they're going up and down like this, even if you just see one going up and down, or if they're breathing air, sharks don't breathe air. Dolphins do. Uh, if you see a shark laying like this on its side, it's an otter. 
It's, well, we don't really have otters down here. It's a sea lion waving at you. They, they'll sun themselves and people can mistake them for sharks. It is really, 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 really rare for someone to actually see a shark. People think they see him, but they, they don't see him. And the one that's going to bite you isn't the one that's playing with you. If it's going to bite you, it's stalking you, and you're never going to see it. True. So if you do see one or you think you see one, you can get out of the water. But don't freak out because the odds are you're not right. You know, we It happens to us all the time. We'll be sitting in our truck and we'll see a fin or something, and the first thing instinctually is, oh, crap, what's that? But then we pull our binoculars out and we just go, oh, cool, it's a, it's a dolphin or whatever. You know, so. Don't let your mind play tricks on you. Anything else you want us to? Is it true that if they're dolphins, there probably won't be sharks in the area? Yes, yes and no. Yes and no. So if there's dolphins that are just doing their normal behavior, they're out there playing around, then you don't have to worry about sharks. If you have dolphins, and I know this is going to sound crazy, but this is what happened in uh, Corona Del Mar, if you have dolphins inside the surf line in water that's this deep, that's not normal dolphin behavior. They're hiding from something. So if you're out there on the lineup and you've got not dolphins catching waves, they do that, that's normal. But if they're in there and they're, it looks like they're trying to beach themselves, you should probably go. But I've only seen that once. Right? So it's, you're not going to see it. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you, it's not going to happen. Have you ever seen an orca? Like, because I know they do like migrate down the coast. So. so we do have a family of orca that lives off Dana Point. Usually, they do occasionally come here. They're not dangerous. Um, the only time I've ever personally seen one, I was up in Washington. They're very cool creatures. I, I've seen some at Lake once or twice. I mean, they're out there. We, last year, there was a sighting. People took pictures of them from the beach off G Street. So yeah. they're they're around. They're just there's only one pod, and they usually hang out. Uh, yeah, when I was asking Santa Cruz, I actually saw a couple of cuts off the beach. Very cool. Yeah, they're everywhere. They live. They even live in tropical waters. It's yeah, it's only like rare things. Oh, no. Anything else specifically before we go outside? Uh, sea lions. Yeah, sea lions are awesome. Don't touch them. They'll bite you. <laughs> uh, they're called, you know, water dogs for a reason. Uh, they're not tame. They haven't been trained. They're not Sea World. They're gonna bite you. If you see one on the beach and you walk up to it, it doesn't run away, it's sick or injured, and they get very defensive. If you see one with a, a small one with a baby, stay away from them. But kind of just like any other wild animal, and this is important, the ocean is like going into the forest. I know it doesn't look like that because everything's underwater, but if you go into the forest and you see, I don't know, a coyote or something, and it runs away from you, you don't need to be worried about it. But if it sits there and as you walk up towards it, it starts staring at you, probably shouldn't try to pet it. Right? Well, that, that's the same thing with a sea lion. If they're out there, they'll cruise around. They might even screw around with you. They might be swimming around you. Don't worry about it. It's when they're acting weird that you need to be worried about it. If they're on the beach and you walk up to it and it doesn't move away, it's going to be defensive. Yes? I was going to say, in a rare chance that we find like an injured animal, do we still call animal control? Or is there someone that's like, Side. You can call animal control, you can call us, you can call friends of the sea lions. Any one of us gets called, we call the other people. It's just like our dispatching center. If you can call us for anything, and we'll let the right people know. So, yeah, anybody's fine. Um, so, if you notice, like, you know, something that's like strange going on, like dolphins acting strange or something, uh, but they're not like beeps, but they're just acting strange, should we let you guys know, like, like kind of warn you guys, like, hey, like, there's some weird activity? You can, but I mean, we want to know what the underlying cause is. All so right. try and figure out what the underlying cause is. All right, sure. And, and no phone calls, they're sharks, they're sharks, they're sharks. <laughs> Unless you're looking at one, right? <laughs> and, you know it's, and know it's one for sure, right? I mean, I'm not trying to deter anybody from making a phone call if there's something going on, but we get a lot of not prank calls, people that think that they're right, and they're just wrong. So. You know, and it's, it's okay. You know, it's, it's okay. It happens. To, it happens in life. It's no big deal. But, but yeah, we don't. We don't want to be chasing down golfing all day. <laughs> I mean, we do want to. But we're not doing our job. True. All right. So let's uh, walk out to the pier.
started right off 17th Street. You got swept all the way down through here, through the pier, all the way to the other side of 28th Street, which is the first set of rocks. We found them on the other side of the rocks. So that was a major one. Um, but yeah, these are our rescue tubes. <clears throat> and occasionally they do break, believe it or not. Uh, like 15 years ago when I started, they were red. And the line went all the way through the middle. The newer version, this is just kind of glued on the end. And the same on the other side. So in head high plus surf, they're reliable. In 15 to 20 foot surf, they're not super reliable. Especially if they're older. Manage the strap. I usually just put my thumb over it so I got plenty of room. Who wants to be a victim? Oh yeah. Oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> you look like a victim. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, stand right there, and we'll I'll swim up, and I'll stay about this far away from you and patch the buoy, because even though she's nice and calm out of the water, a lot of times people in the water, hey, if we're going to rescue, you're having a bad day, right? So we don't want you climbing on us. Hey, how you doing? Oh, you look, like, you look like you're doing great, except that you're drowning. <laughs> so here we go, now she's clipped in. And it's her job to hold on to the buoy, but even if she doesn't, that's okay, because we've got the strap around her. There's two clips. There's one for adults, and then there's one for kids. She's actually sitting the kid one, but just kidding. <laughs> nice, most adults don't anymore. So here we go. I'm just gonna say, lay on your back and start kicking. And I'm gonna swim in like this, hopefully she kicks. <laughs> Doesn't always happen. Sometimes people just become anchors, sea anchors. They, they stay like this and try to make as much resistance as they possibly can, make our job harder. But yeah, that's it. And once we get you into about wasted water, we'll take this off. And just like she wants to walk away and not say thank you to the guy that you saved her life. Thank you very much. What our job is to do <laughs> is to grab her by the wrist or by the arm, depending on how bad they are, and walk into where they're not even in the water anymore. Because not, not to like, restrain you or whatever, and if the person doesn't want us to touch them, that's okay. But we want to make sure they're completely out of the water. Then after that, we stop and we have a quick dialogue. It goes like this. So, do you know what just happened? No. Most of the time, that's the answer we get, believe it or not. People have no idea what it just did. They don't know why they just got rescued. They're usually embarrassed. So we'll sit there and we'll say, okay, well, if you take a look at the tower, you see there's a yellow flag up there. You don't want anybody going out past their waist without two fins on on the yellow flag day unless you're surfing and you know what you're doing. The reason for that is the yellow flag goes up when you have in your surf condition. We have strong ribs. Speaking of which, the one that you were in is right there. And then we explain how the water uh, comes in from the set, moves down the beach, finds the deepest spot in the ocean, or the deepest spot in the sand. All the water goes out right there. You can see that brown rib that's going right out the sea. That's what you were in, that's why you went out and grabbed it. So when you get out of the next time, you can come right over here. And you swim. It's usually here, we'll say you're swimming kind of towards the base of the pier. If you aim at the base of the pier from down the beach, you're swimming in the right direction. Then, do you have any questions? Hey, do me a favor, tell your family what just happened. Give them the same advice I just told you, so that I'm not rescuing every other member of her family or friends individually. <laughs> have a good day. Thank you.